I reminded you of John Hagee's blood moon predictions. And those things, when he was speaking on those things, it was going viral. It was all over the internet. He sold I don't know how many books. They made a movie. These men make money. When I discover something in Scripture for myself, and then I want to very excitingly teach it because it's just such a blessing to me. I can, like, find out things, say, about the man of sin or Matthew 24. And I'm saying, hey, you know, there's something I wasn't seeing here. Now, I'm thinking to myself, now, how can I tell as many people as I can and have them hear this so they can benefit from it? I'm trying to think how I can get it out there and here's the context for nothing. <laughs> I'm not thinking, boy, I think I, there's a windfall to be made here. When word gets around, there's some good things in there. They're going to cough up the, the dough. This, is this what these men do? This is how they conduct their ministries? Well, no doubt he made a lot of money. And uh, I said I wanted to lay the axe to the root. I don't care about how he came up with his August 30th thing. I want to lay the axe to the root and argue in a more fundamental way. Turn to Second Thessalonians chapter 1, and that's what we started. We, well, we went through chapter 1 last week. Second Thessalonians 1. If we're going to talk about the man of sin, uh, the most fundamental text to go to is Second Thessalonians 2, which talks about the man of sin. And I said to you last week, we, they, they always read 2 Thessalonians 2 isolated from 2 Thessalonians 1. And so you have 2 Thessalonians 2, you know, coming out of your ears. But then we're relatively ignorant of 2 Thessalonians 1, and 1 flows into 2. And if we can, and I'm not going to re-preach the sermon from last week, but I want us to refresh ourselves by just by sort of reading this first chapter here. And, and then I want to pick it up where we left off in our thoughts in chapter 2. But it's very obvious the Thessalonians were under tribulation then, okay? Verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the assembly of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, and that would be the Thessalonian believers, alive in the first century. For you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And we noted that faith grows when it's tried. So by implication, we sort of have an inkling here that they're going through something. And the charity of every one of you towards each other aboundeth. Charity abounds when tribulation comes because the need is great, and we circle the wagons. Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you, that would be the Thessalonians, in in the assemblies of God for your patience and faith. The fact that he glories in their patience means it's being tried. And if he's glorying in their patience, I would judge that the trial is somewhat severe for Paul to respond this way. For your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Now, it's just spelled out there. It doesn't even need explanation. You are going through persecution and tribulation. And right now, you're enduring it. It's something that you're suffering under. Verse 5, which is the manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. And don't forget, we also noted, and we know this by going through the book of Acts on Wednesday nights, the suffering that Paul underwent when he went to uh, Thessalonica. He suffered greatly himself. Not a good place. Verse 6, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. They were in tribulation. They were in great tribulation. And Paul is saying it is a a righteous thing for God to heap tribulation on the heads of those who are now bringing tribulation to you. And to you who are troubled, to you who are in this tribulation, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
if this first chapter is talking about the tribulation, as opposed to another tribulation, then obviously verses 7 and 8 would be akin to what we read in Matthew 24. Same language, you know, right down the line, it's the same thing. We see hardly any difference. The flaming fire coming with his angels to judge his enemies, to judge the enemies of the people of God in that generation. You can see the the continuity of all these thoughts. And then we noted in verse 9 and 10, who shall be punished with ever these these men that are responsible for this tribulation on the saints of God, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because of our testimony among you was believed, in that day. I told you that verse 9 and 10 can be seen two ways. It can be seen as the consequence of, of their sin being heaped upon them at the last day in judgment, verses 9 and 10, or it, you can be also understood as the continuation of verses 7 and 8, referencing his coming in that generation in their day where he would judge their enemies and give them relief from that tribulation. And it wasn't my goal to, uh, uh, to dissect that. It's not necessary for what we're doing here. And then in verse 11 and 12, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. What calling do they have? Tribulation. And fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, there's no chapter division here. This is just a letter. Now we beseech you, brethren... By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, is this a different coming than the one in verse 7 and 8? Wouldn't seem so. I mean, we don't really have an indication. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And why does he come in the first chapter? To intervene on behalf of the Thessalonians who are going through tribulation. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. And when we went through Matthew 24, we talked about our gathering together unto him. Same phrase was used. And we discovered that when you look up that phrase in the New Testament, that more often than not, it's not talking about a physical gathering. Like Jesus, as the mother hen, he would have gathered together those chicks under his wings. I would have, I desired to gather you together. He didn't mean, I'm going to, you know, I wish the Jews would have just gotten all, I would have met them at a certain place. No, he was talking about gathering together in faith. It's a spiritual gathering. It was always about the spiritual. It was about faith in Christ and why he came to this earth. And that's what he's talking about. And time, we're not going to reduplicate that sermon either from however long ago that was. But in Matthew 24, our gathering together unto him. So if you read that the same way here, it makes sense. If you're looking at it through the eyes of the first century. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that apocalyptic coming in judgment to destroy the enemies of Christ who are persecuting the people of God and putting them under tribulation. And he's going to put a stop to it in that generation. When he brings his kingdom, which is going to come before all his disciples pass away. And is going to come before they can even finish going over the cities of, Ju- uh, of, of Judea. Ooh. It's a mouthful when you tie it all together. And that's not all, but when you tie a portion of it together. <laughs> now, concerning this spiritual gathering at his coming to do this, we're told in verse 2 that ye be not... Su- so, concerning... The, the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day of his coming shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So it is very obvious that Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, in light of their tribulation, which is severe, he's saying, look, don't worry as if the day of Christ is at hand, and we'll focus on that again, if you remember, the day of Christ is at hand, because the man of sin has to come first. 
And then we noted something that is uh, uh, an astounding, uh, an astounding truth here: that the day of Christ is at hand. And that phrase "at hand," if you remember, we said it was the the, the Greek word anestikin, anestikin, and that. Word anestikin is a perfect tense verb, which invariably means that the action was completed in the past, but the effects of that action are reverberating and being experienced in the present. Now, we don't really have English verbs that get that detail, that give you quite that amount of information. We have to uh, maybe judge it from context. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes uh, in Greek you have to judge things from context and context, and uh, not from. And that's really true with Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew was a pretty limited uh, language, and there's all sorts of inferences you have to make. That's why there's a lot of arguments sometimes about translation uh, in Hebrew. Um, but that day of Christ is at hand now, because that's a pres- that at hand is a uh, 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 a perfect tense uh, verb. That means it was completed in the past. So don't be worried. Don't be troubled by your spirit or by any word that you've heard or speech that you've heard, heard me give or by any letter that supposedly came from us or maybe did come from us. Don't misunderstand these things as if the day of Christ has already happened and so it's here right now. That his kingdom is here right now and that it's already happened in its fullness. He's saying that's not true. You're thinking that, but it's not true. I don't want you to think that. Because that can't happen until the man of sin be revealed. Now, there's no argument of this. Now, I know, and as I said to you last week, uh, the day of Christ is at hand in the, in the King James Version, meaning in the sense that it's at hand, it's all around, it's, it's here. And I told you, and we looked at many, many... Um, uh, translations of this, and we discover that it almost seemed like you know a good portion of them would translate it. Uh, don't worry that the day of Christ is here, present, or that is present. And the other translations would say that the day of Christ has already come. And I said to you, they're both right because you know we don't have a singular English word that communicates both ideas. So some trans- translate it that it's here. Some translate it that it has already come. They're both right. That, it, that Christ has already come. And that, and he, when he comes, he comes in his kingdom and glory. And so that his kingdom in its full manifestation is already here. Now we know the kingdom of Christ had already come spiritually and was then uh, in place when Christ was resurrected and ascended to the Father at the Father's right hand. But he comes in, its, in his fullness of that kingdom and the manifestation of the glory of God as it's witnessed before all the nation and before all the, all the world when Jerusalem is destroyed and God says, there's my exclamation point at the end of the sentence and so that all men would know everywhere. Jesus was the Christ, the son of a living God and he came and did exactly what he said he would. We never thought it could have happened. And so the reality of that day is, is very, very powerful Paul is saying, don't think that the day has already come. And that's the present reality. Because that doesn't reach, it doesn't reach that zenith of fulfillment until the man of sin is revealed. There has to be first an apostrophe, and then the man of sin must be revealed. And then all this will happen in its its fullness. That is the argument Paul is laying out, uh, basically. Um, well, then we keep reading verse 4, who, and speaking of the man of sin, who poseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I'm not going to have really time to get into that. We actually talked about that. We, we, we went through Second Thessalonians 2 last year. After we went, I think we started off talking about the imminency text. Here's the broad thing of what we've done now. We've talked about a whole bunch of passages. We've started off the imminency text that cannot be denied. You've got to deal with them. The critics are insulting us. You can't stick your head in the sand. So we spent a block of time doing that. And then we went to Revelation and we said, when was Revelation written? We don't care what some church father said in 400 AD. 
What's the internal evidence? Is there internal evidence as to when Revelation was written? And it's all over the place. And we determined Revelation had to have been written while the temple was still up and about. And uh, the day was at hand, and it was coming quickly. And we understood from all the language and, and witness of uh, Revelation that it was a book written uh, prior to 70 AD. And then after doing that, we talked, to, and, and well, while we talked about Revelation, we got into the beast. We looked at Daniel and the beast, and we talked about the Antichrist, and we talked about Nero at length. And that was another phase. And then when we left that phase, I said, in a sense, I want to take a break from it, but I want to do one more thing, Matthew 24. And so we've been spending time. These are the, the big subdivisions. We spent, we've been spending a lot of time in Matthew 24, but you see how eye-opening Matthew 24 is. And we've still got to finish the second part of Matthew 24, but I think it will take a... We'll take a little break before we... The last, the last verses we can cover far quicker than the first half. Because now, once you get the first half under your belt, it's just a matter of what's the context to understand the second half. Once you have a context to understand the second half, that just sort of flows uh, pretty naturally. But we, we will do it. So now I'm going back here, and I'm going back here to Thessalonians because of what John Hagee's saying, August 30th. So we know that the man of sin is going to exalt himself and all this. But look what he says in verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until it be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Now, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, if we want to imagine that the mystery of iniquity is not related to the man of sin, just to wiggle out of this, it's just hard to imagine that being accurate considering the context of what we're reading. The law, the man of sin is the lawless one. The mystery of iniquity. It's like the, the, the secret of his wickedness, you see? But the subject is this man of sin who's going to do all these nasty things, which he must come or at least reveal himself before the day of Christ fully arrives and, and comes. He must be shown. He must be revealed, see? But we're told in verse 7, but the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, like I said to you last week, well, I, uh, it was already, already at work 2,000 years ago and you know, so what are we saying? Are we saying, he's, well, he's been working and working and working and working. And 2,000 years later, he still hasn't made manifest. He hasn't made manifest, but he's still working. How old is this guy? I mean, really? I mean, who is this man? This Rip Van Winkle. This eschatological Rip Van Winkle. Mystery of iniquity. <laughs> the mystery of iniquity. That's already work. Um, and again, this is not to say that at this point, when Paul wrote that, that he's been let loose to his full power. No, no, no. No, no, that's not true, because in verse 6, which, well, in, well, in verse 7, but for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, letteth, archaic, meaning hinders, he who hinders will continue to hinder him until he, that hindering force, is will be taken out of the way. So what we're being told is the mystery of iniquity of this man of sin is already working, but he's being restrained right now. There's a hindering force that's restraining him, but he that hindering force will still be soon be removed, and when that happens, then he's made manifest. After he's made manifest, then the day of Christ can come when he comes to judge his enemies. And he comes to relieve you of your tribulation. Now, uh, that's a pretty profound rendering in light of the way that we usually hear of these things. But how is it not true? It's not true because that means I wasted all my time reading those Dave Hunt books. <laughs> yep. But, you know, don't be ashamed of that. If you read Hal Lindsey, Dave Hunt, whoever, 
Isn't that part of the learning process? And so a man's a scientist, and he, he has to have a thousand experiments fail until the one reveals to him what the truth is. He'd never get to that without the failures. Even the vacuum cleaner salesman knows that. You have to knock on a hundred doors to sell one vacuum cleaner. But you say, well, I should just be able to walk up to a door, and that's the one that's going to buy it. That's not how it works. And the truth is, it's even more so with this, because you learn line upon line, precept uh, upon precept. So verse 7 is plain. The indication is that the man of sin is already alive. Then, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Then, 2,000 years ago, when Paul wrote this, but he is being now restrained for the time being according to the second part of uh, verse 7. And again, read verse 6 with verse 7. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. So he is alive and he's restrained. Now, in verse 6, and now ye know, and the ye is the Thessalonian believers. There's no, it's not talking about you or me or Dave Hunt or Thomas Ice or Hal Lindsay or anybody. It's talking about the Thessalonians. They knew something, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. They knew. They knew who the hindering force was. Now all the Christians run around today, who who is the hindering force that keeps the men of sin at bay? And everybody has their theories and they come up with things and they're all wondering and questioning. They knew. They knew. How did they know? It's a good question. How did they know? I mean, uh, this verse, verse 6, seems to demand of us an understanding of a first century fulfillment because the Thessalonians knew who was restraining the man of sin. You know why they knew? Because they were the contemporaries of the reality. Would they know who's going to restrain the John Hagee man of sin 2,000 years in the future when they wouldn't even know who that man of sin was? And could not even picture our world as it is today. What, 2,000 years ago? Um, But they knew. Um, He was already at work, and they knew what was holding him back. Now, I want you to think about that. The the, The mystery of iniquity was already at work. Now, let's look at a couple of the texts, and we'll come back here in a few minutes. 1 John 4. 1 John 4. Now, see, I'm thinking, I'm reading in verse 7 in 2 Thessalonians 2, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He already works, which means he is. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, we read verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already is it in the world. Now, there was no Pope, I guarantee you, when Paul wrote Thessalonians. There was no Pope. There was no Roman Catholic Church. When Paul wrote Thessalonians. Oh, and John wrote 1 John. There was no Pope. No Pope. There was no Roman Catholic Church then. You know, Rome didn't even make Christianity legal until uh, 325 or 313. And then it was after that, at some point, that they finally made it the religion of the state. But in the first century, think of Nero and these fellas they got more persecution than anything. Peter was not the first pope, brethren. That's not our belief. But we're told that in John's day that there were already many antichrists. 
even now is he already in the world. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, where ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. The spirit of anti-Christianity was already then in existence. But that's not too surprising when you relate it to uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, when the mystery of iniquity is already working. Unless you say the mystery of iniquity has nothing to do with the Antichrist. But most people think they're connected. I'm just arguing from their, their understanding of connected, connectiveness. So that's an interesting uh, hmm, situation. Uh, turn to uh, 1 John 2. 1 John 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time, not the end of the world, but the end of that old covenant age that's going to come to a uh, an apocalyptic and cataclysmic end when Christ is glorified and he's re- seen in his glory in his kingdom when he comes and destroys his enemies that murdered him and put him on a cross and mocked him and boasted of Moses and the prophets and God will call them all liars publicly by destroying them exactly as Jesus said would happen in that generation just like he said. They would understand it. This is Christ. And even then, there are many. I don't think there's a lot of popes running around there. We no cat, cat Roman Catholic Church then. So these things in John match the time frame Paul drives us to in verse seven of Second Thessalonians chapter two. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, again, if the man of sin is someone in our future, and We today still don't know, still don't know who he is. Then if we don't know who he he is, how can we know, how can we know what this restraining influence is that's keeping him at bay? We don't even know who he is. Here's a better question. How could the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago know what's restraining the men of sin in our future? They can't even imagine, not, not, not only would they not know that man of sin that's in our future, they can't even picture our society. How do they know? And why would they know who, what's restraining him and we don't? Well, I think the answer is because they were living in that time and they did know. Paul said they did. Must be true. The man of sin, as Paul has been indicating here, the mystery of iniquity was already at work. The spirit of Antichrist was already there. Even now there are many Antichrists. But he was restrained. He was there working, but he was rest- restrained. <clears throat> and Paul said to the Thessalonians that they knew, they knew who was restraining him. Uh, but uh, soon that restraining influence would be removed, and then he would be revealed now, here's a question. Uh, the dispensational say, we know who the restrainer is. It's the Holy Spirit. What do you, you mean? Oh, yeah, it's simple. The rapture of the church. So with the rapture of the church, the Holy Spirit only indwells believers, right? True. The Holy Spirit isn't in the well over there. The Holy Spirit is in us. So when the church is raptured, no more Holy Spirit on the earth. And the Holy Spirit is the restraining influence that keeps the man of sin at bay. So the rapture has to happen for the man of sin to be revealed, they say. Of course, the day of Christ can't happen until the man of sin is revealed. So which way is it? You know, let's, you know, I'm going with Paul. (laughs) That the day of Christ and his coming cannot take place until the man of sin is revealed. Um, And I would judge... Uh, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, and they're right, if the restrainer is the Holy Spirit being removed from the earth by the rapture of the church, then we must conclude from this text that the rapture of the church happened in the first century. 
We'd have to conclude that because the mystery of iniquity was already at work in their day. We know that the spirit of Antichrist was already working in their day. We know that the Lord would come in that generation to put an end to that tribulation and to judge his enemies that bring that tribulation on God's people. And he's going to put a stop to it in that generation and in that day. And so if the the restraining influence is the removal of the church because the Holy Spirit dwells in God's people, then the rapture had to take place in the first century. No, that's not acceptable. I don't believe that at all. And I would raise this issue. Um, The Holy Spirit has a certain function according to Scripture. We could turn this into a whole sermon and make it part of a series. I'm just going to say it to you because I know you already know it's true. I'm not going to take the time to prove it to you. The Holy Spirit's function is to illuminate minds and to open eyes and to enable them to see the truth of Scripture. We could go to all sorts of Scripture that tells us that. That's the function and the job of the Holy Spirit, to open our eyes and enable us to see. The Holy Spirit also, another function of the Holy Spirit, is that he empowers Christians in their walk with Christ. Uh, the victory that we have, and we don't have perfect victory, but the victory we have, we have by virtue of God indwelling us and living in us. And he does so through the Holy Spirit. So that's another function of the Holy Spirit, to empower Christians to have victory in their Christian walk. And the other function of the Holy Spirit is, well, that's a byproduct of the second one. He gives them the power to have victory, but by that power being given to them, And having victory, they also bear fruit. There is the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And all of those, that fruit is the byproduct of the Holy Spirit. I have just described for you, as far as I know, the totality of the Holy Spirit's ministry on this earth with God's people. And I know of no place in Scripture, no place in Scripture, show it to me if I'm wrong, And I'll be glad to see it, but I'm not aware of any place in Scripture that teaches us in any way, shape, or form that the Holy Spirit is responsible for restraining wicked and evil men in their sin and depravity on this earth. It's not the job of the Holy Spirit to, to restrain men in their evil. I'm talking about unconverted unbelievers in whom they do the Holy Spirit does not dwell. And yet they're saying that's the job of the Holy Spirit, so he must be the one keeping the men of sin from being as evil as he could be. Well, well why? The man of sin is not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So it's not the Holy Spirit's job. If it is the Holy Spirit's job to restrain wicked men from their evil acts, then the Holy Spirit has failed. And I don't believe that for a second. So, you know, sometimes you just have to think out loud. And (laughs) tradition gets thrown out the window. Preconceived notions get thrown out the window. And saying, oh, trust God's word. And it's sometimes interesting where it, it will take you. Sometimes it takes you far away from home where everything's comfy and cozy. Um... The restraining, you say, well, okay, then what is the restraining influence that keeps the man of sin in check? He's working, he's doing something. The spirit of Antichrist was already there. The mystery of iniquity was already there, but he's hindered. He's not non-existent. He's hindered. He's there then. So what is this hindering force that keeps the lawless one at bay well I would ask you a question who according to scripture is responsible for restraining men in their evil acts government that is the mandate God gives to government Romans 13 the government's role is to sit in the stead of God and to punish evildoers That's the job of government, to punish evildoers. Government is there to restrain men in their wicked acts in sin and to punish them. And the punishment is a form of restraint. 
It's a threat. It's a sword that's being held over their head. Who is it that's responsible for restraining the lawless one? Then, well, government, what's that mean? In the context here, it means Caesar. Caesar is responsible because Caesar is the government. Then, in those days, and that's the days we're talking about, And how does Caesar do it? By virtue of the laws of Rome. Caesar is the enforcer of the laws of Rome. And you got to remember, that's been proven true in the Bible. Uh, The Apostle Paul, when he was being assaulted by his Jewish enemies that wanted him dead, at one point he appealed to Caesar. As a Roman citizen. Why did he appeal to Caesar? Because Caesar at that point. Would protect the Christians. By implementing the laws of Rome. That would protect them. That he who now lets will let. Until he be taken out of the way. The Caesars that existed before Nero. Were not perfect. No leader ever has been. They may have had many bad qualities. But fundamentally. The Christians were protected by them. We are, that's not a theory. Paul was protected by them. We know that. We've been looking at it even in the book of Acts. And we just went uh, through the account where the, uh, the Roman governor, Paul was about to answer and defend himself before his enemies, and the governor says, No, this is a squabble between Jews. I'm not going to, no, he's free. And then the guys that accused Paul caught a beating right in front of the Roman governor. You could appeal to Rome then. Because Rome implemented its laws, which did protect uh, uh, the Christians, at least early on. Um, Nero became Caesar two years after 2 Thessalonians was written. You can look in any of the Bibles that give you dates because there's no argument on Thessalonians uh, uh, being uh, written when it was 51, um, 52 AD. And then you come to find out that Nero became Caesar in 54, two years later. So when we read the mischief of iniquity doth already work. Now, if he's the next in line when that was written to be Caesar, he's already a powerful entity. He, when that Caesar dies, he's going to be the next one. So even before he's Caesar, he's a man of political substance and power already. He's already working his deals. He's already got plans. He's already connected. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hinders. Now, Nero, (laughs) um, Nero came to power and he wasn't immediately the monster he became. So even when Nero became Caesar, he even still wasn't completely revealed it would still take a few years uh, from Nero uh, to come to his full sadism and evil and manifest himself as a lawless one, as one where the Christians can no longer appeal to him. Instead, Paul could appeal to the Caesar before Nero and be freed. But when Nero comes, what happens? He executes Paul and Peter. You can't appeal to this man anymore. You know why? He's lawless. Wasn't true of the fellow before him. The he who now hinders, will hinder, is a man. See, at first I used to think, well, it's the law and it's government. But we see here the personal pronoun, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth. It's not a thing, it's a he. Only he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. I thought, well, if it's law and government, how come it uses a personal pronoun? And then it, you know, occurred to me because 
the law is enforced by the Caesars. And the Caesars did protect the Christians. That's the testimony of the Bible. But when Nero came, not immediately, but when Nero came in office, at a certain point, he became the lawless one. There's no more appeal. In fact, he begins to persecute the Christians. He's the one that brings them into the amphitheaters and tortures them and kills them for sport and does things that are so horrifying and gruesome, it's hard to talk about in, in, in a public setting to Christians. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let to be taken out of the way. But notice what he said again in verse 6. You Thessalonians, you know who it is that's restraining him. They did. They were living under it. They could appeal to Caesar like Paul did. They knew they were on borrowed time. And in Revelation, well, how would they know it would be Nero? Well, there's your 666. We did the math on that. It's Nero Caesar, which is actually his formal title. So they did know. Paul spoke very cagely in Revelation because you know why? He's talking about Nero. He's talking about men that have total power. If he just came out and said, Nero is this and this is going to happen, then Rome's going to come, he's going to go slaughter all the Christians. Paul talks in a way that they would understand, but the Romans won't care to investigate because they could care less about what these Jewish sects are teaching. So that explains the personal pronoun. The he is the previous Caesar's who implement the law. Now, again, in 2 Thessalonians being written 51 to 52 A.D., and Nero became the Caesar in 54 A.D. Um, and by the way, I wanted to say this as well before I move on. I, I just want to give you this because you may have some questions. I don't have time to answer questions that you could have in today's sermon. But some people believe that are thinking along our lines. Some will believe that the beast and Nero and the man of sin are all the same person. And uh, in typical eschatological circles, they, they think it's all the same. And many that will espouse Christ's coming in 70 AD uh, from a partial preterist, they'll say they're the same person. But some of them will say it's not the same person. And some will, some of them will say, I think they all say the beast is Rome, uh, the beast is uh, Rome or Nero, Nero being the personification of that Roman power. And many, many will say that the man of sin is Nero, but others will say the man of ser, uh, sin is not Nero, that the man of sin is different from the beast, that the man of sin could be Vespian. You say Vespian? Why Vespian? Well, the man of sin sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Right? That's right here in Second Thessalonians 2. He sits in the temple of God. Nero never sat in the temple of God. When the Romans came in in 70 AD, Nero wasn't with them. In fact, Nero was dead then. Nero didn't sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He said, well, then it can't be Nero. Well, no, there's a way that it can be. But let me, first, let me tell you what some say. They say, no, we think it could be Vespian. Vespian was the general. When Nero declared war on Jerusalem, we're going to destroy him. It's now time to take him out. He had Vespian as his general. So J Vespian started this war at the command of Nero. Then when Nero killed himself, which was about in the middle of that war, against the Jewish nation, that three-and-a-half-year segment. In the middle, Nero got, uh, was killed. He killed himself. Vespian, the general, became the next Caesar. So he didn't finish the war. He started the war. But now, in the middle of the war, he becomes the Caesar and decides to finish prosecuting this war. And so he makes a new general, Titus, and he sends Titus out as his general. So that Vespian was from the beginning to the end of the whole war. He physically started the war at the command of Nero. And he commanded the end of the war at the physical actions of Titus. So that many surmise that, you know, because when they went into the temple and desecrated it and sat in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, you could say that about Vespian. He was alive then. And the Roman standards, which would cause them to bow down and worship Caesar as God, the, the, the current Caesar at the time was Vespian when they actually invaded the temple. 
So some say we think it could be Vespian, who's actually the man of sin, but Nero is the beast. And so that's that's an argument uh, that, you know, it, there's, uh, there's credibility to that. Nero died in 68 AD in June. So he's right. he died right in the middle of the three-and-a-half-year war of Rome against Jerusalem. And then when he died in 68, uh, Galba, you had these succession of fast uh, Caesars. You had Galba, who died in 69. You had Otho, who died in 69. And you had Vitilis, who died in 69. Bang, bang, boom. And then Vespian. So you had three guys that lasted a few months each, and then Vespian came in, and he didn't die uh, uh, until you know many years later. And his was a reestablished kingdom. And so because of that, many think of the beast, his head is wounded, and he comes back. Nero comes back as Vespian. Not, not, we're not talking about reincarnation, but uh, the same way that John the Baptist is Elijah the prophet. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah. And so that Vespian is the continuation of the evil of Nero. The beast's head is wounded, um, and he comes back. But a lot of those details, we don't, you know, um, it's very interesting to see, wow, yeah, things, it really is amazing. But I, I really just really want to see the overall picture here. There are demands being made of us here that we have to, uh, we have to acknowledge. Nero was already at work in 52 AD because he became Caesar in 54 AD. And he was restrained by the previous Caesar who did implement the law and would protect the Christians that were citizens in Rome with the laws of Rome. Nero wouldn't do it. He changed everything and he became lawless. And when Nero became to full power, he revealed himself for who he was. Um, well, I'm going to leave it there for now. <laughs> Got too much left here. But I'll just say this. John Hagee says, Man of sin is alive now. He's going to be revealed August 30th. Now, again, I said that to you last week. You see, I'm not being a smart aleck when I say, well, how does he come up with August 30th? My answer was, who cares? <laughs> I'm saying, no, don't get involved with all that. Strike at the root. And the way you strike at the root is just by believing the Bible and saying yes to it and uh, the elder was talking w with me about this uh, after the Lord's table, and uh, he was just a acknowledging how he enjoys that idea, the idea of just trust the Lord and believe what he says, and when you can't figure it all out, the one thing you can figure out is this. He's right, and what he says is true, and let your understanding catch up later. If God is pleased to even reveal it to us, because we see through a glass darkly, we won't know all things. We won't have all answers. I don't have all answers. I have things that I could talk about with you that may, I've said this to you before, things I could talk about with you that I'm not 100% convinced on that may be somewhat surprising to some of you. Not because I'm a heretic or becoming liberal, but because when you look at a, a deeper level, when you look at a more profound, biblical, solar scriptural level, you ask yourself questions. And that's why I sort of indicated what I said at the Lord's table. Jesus died, but what does that mean? And did he go to paradise? Did he go, did he go to Hades? Was he there at the same time? Was he there at the, both places at the same time as God the Son? Was he there? I mean, well, it had to be there as God the Son, but God the Son or Jesus the Man? But only Jesus the Man could die. God could never die. See, this becomes one thing we know. He died and rose again, and that he was God, and as God could never cease to be. But as a man, he died. I can't give you the answer for how he could do this or in what a state he did that, if that's even a proper way to frame it even. And so it is with many things in Scripture. There's often more than meets the eye because God, God is incomprehensible and his ways are not our ways. And the sooner we make peace with that, the easier our lives will be. And we can just walk by faith, which is sort of, a liberating thing to do on this Independence Day. <laughs> Let's bow our heads in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank Thee for the liberation that we have in Christ, who by His grace grants to us faith that causes us to believe Thee, even when we don't understand Thee. But Father, we trust Thee as children. We pray that Thou would reward and bless that trust with a greater understanding to the degree that it pleases Thee to open up our hearts and minds, that we might know Christ aright and in the way that pleases Thee, that we might honor Him in the way that pleases Thee, and that we would speak truth, that we would know how to hold our tongue, and that we'll also know how to speak. So humble us and make us students. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.